I will give some answers this morning to individuals, of course, with things which you have had on your mind. I will not even say to, who, to whom I am talking. Uh, the first answer is, having lost one's innocence in Krishna consciousness, If you have ever been discouraged by some leader of Krishna consciousness, something made you unhappy, something made you lose your trust in what other devotees do, makes me think of Prabhupada Kripa, who worked so hard for, uh, for one temple many years ago, and then the temple was practically never opened. Wie hieß das? Wie hieß das da? Gutenstein. It's one example where you become discouraged. I put so much energy, I want to do something, and then it doesn't happen. No? It's just an example, no? And when after that happens, you feel like, oh, I don't believe in the leaders anymore. I wanted to say something about having lost one's innocence. <coughs> that factually the circumstances of life there are always blessings we should see everything as a blessing that was the teaching of Srila Srila Maharaj Rather than losing one's innocence, we should increase our innocence. Of course, that's a, that's a way of looking about it. Like, look upon myself. I started a mission completely under my responsibility in 1984. I was quite an independent fellow even before that, because I was always on my own. There was no other leader, so they came once a year or something like that. But 1984, I decided with Hari Maharaj, we are going to become responsible here. We don't want to be depending on other people's rather deficient management. And <coughs> at that time, it was an interesting moment. It was in Bogota, Colombia. <coughs> at that time, we had no books. We had nothing. We had to start from scratch. Only we had a little farm where we were feeling very happy. And, well, not, not totally from scratch because we had a beautiful group of devotees with us. But from then on, in our Rinda mission, I have the future on my shoulders, and like a family. Father of a family, he has his family on his shoulders. He can say to the neighbors, hey, can you take care of my family? And the neighbor is going to say, sorry, I have my own family, you know. <coughs> I'm too busy. So to have a, fa a devotee family on your shoulders, what does that mean? 
You know, it means birth, old age, disease, and death. <laughs> it means you have to cope with everything. With the newborn, with the aging, with the sick, and with the dying. And with the living as well. <laughs> In all the different expectations of life. So, what does that mean? There's one big question everybody has in life. You also know that question. How will I survive? How will I make ends meet? How will I... Well, basically you could say sleep and eat. What is my security there? What to do, where to go? All these things, you know? <coughs> and not only what will I do, next question is what will my children do? So, when you don't have any children, you don't worry about that so much. As a matter of fact, you can hardly relate to it. But when you do have children, it's on your mind almost every day. What will they do? What will they do? How will they live? What will they study? What profession will they have? Let's take Gopinath as an example. This youthful chap who is enthusiastically and lovingly running around here in the Mela, he has a very harsh future facing him because he was born in Kali Yuga and he was born in a world which is somehow in a strange semi collapse which actually, if you look clearly and carefully, it is not real collapse. It is the collapse of the income of the poor people and the increase of the income of the rich people. <laughs> That's what it is really. Uh, Prabhupada mentioned that in Shima Bhagavatam. Mean, he says the governments are always thinking how to extract more from the citizens, how to charge level more taxes, how to, uh, how to make their life more dependent, more slavery, so that they are totally dependent on them. You know, totalitarian, authoritarian systems. Well, in one way or another, the most systems are like that. Maybe Swedish socialism is not extremely like that. But basically you could say the anxiety is on everywhere. So one thing you can do, you can be in an anxiety and the other one is don't be in an anxiety. That's my fault. Don't be in anxiety. Be relaxed. Be part of the solution of ignorance. Well, what's our formula for that? Not very complicated. Feed people with prasad. Feed people with mantras and transcendental sound. Feed people with Vaishnava friendship. And feed people with transcendental knowledge in the form of books. So we are actually in the spiritual feeding department. 
For example, in South America, talking about innocence, in many places the devotees go daily on Harinam Sankita. Daily they go with instruments and chant in the street. Not in so many places, it takes a lot of good administration to do that. But in some cities, no fail every day. Medellin, Colombia, the city made a poster of what the city looks like. And in that poster, which was like by drawing, on the main square they had the Hare Krishna Harina party. <laughs> <laughs> so, belongs to the city picture for the last 16, 17, 20 years. So they said, okay, they belong here. These are our Hare Krishna Harinams. <laughs> huh? Innocence is spending your energy for Krishna, like Harinam. Harinam is not a. a a venture of producing income. Just a short understanding question. Innocence in German, I have all, all the time Unschuld, Unschuld in, yeah. in mind. Yeah. You are talking about it. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So, in order to do Harinam, you've got to be very innocent because you are renouncing your income at that moment at least, just to sing and dance with the people. As a matter of fact, the devotees, they do plenty of things just meant to help others. And whether there's going to come some income or not, doesn't matter. I could say to you, and that's not totally true, but at least 80% true, <coughs> That in our preaching in South America, we are not calculating about what income we are getting. We are just living, dancing, cooking, singing, spending if there is something to spend, not spending if there is nothing to spend, and having a grand old time. the truth for Lima. Now it doesn't mean that we are not doing a marathon here and there and we get enthusiastic for distributing books or that one devotee is doing some business and giving a donation. I'm not saying it's not an extremist thing, but basically our movement has been concerned with dana, with giving. And giving in situations and circumstances which are far, far more precarious than North America, than Europe or North America. Far, far more precarious. But because we have done that, we have taken that attitude, it has come in our favor. that we are quite well. We have the most beautiful farms, we have plenty of books, the devotees have opened plenty of restaurants. Each restaurant turns into a preaching center at night. There's plenty of of different groups doing different things. Retreats, volunteers, dancing groups. Practically every bigger temple has a dance group. Some women doing Bharatnatyam or Odissi dancing. You could say we have a plenty of luxuries. And the devotees, most of them individually are not wealthy, but those who are grihastas, they're managing quite well. Very rarely 
a Grihasta comes to me and says, I'm in an utter emergency, can you help me? Very rarely. Which means they're managing, no? Somehow other they're managing. But my vision of the future, nevertheless, is a vision of increasing the name and fame and dignity and capacity of the devotees to give to the society true soul doctor's help. Of course, we're already doing that. Because the magic of all my mysteries and of all medicines, it's called the Bhagavad Gita. If you give somebody Bhagavad Gita, you give him something better than that, he couldn't get anything better. It doesn't matter if he's dying in three days. That's the best thing. Maybe, maybe he gets to read the Bhagavad Gita a few shlokas before he dies. Maybe his heart gets touched. So we are, we are always on the vanguard of contributing to the essence. Same thing if you give somebody prasada. Somebody eats prasada, he may be saved from repeated birth and death just by taking prasada once. So it's not that we are either relaxed or that we are not concerned in any way. No. We are there from morning to night with heart and soul to help the people. And I am so ambitious that I want my disciples to become very inspired preachers. What do I have to do for that? I just have to convince them to put themselves at Krishna's disposal. Because an inspired preacher is that person who's trying to speak on behalf of the truth and God, and God does the rest. Beautiful. I was requested to give my first Sunday feast class. I was not even two or three months in the movement. There was no other senior devotee that Sunday feast. So somebody said, you have to give the class, you have to give the class, the people are sitting there. I say, what am I going to talk about? I say, just, just speak. <coughs> so I had been reading the Ishopanishad in those days. So I said, so I give a class from Ishopanishad. It was my first Sunday class. So I just sat down and started talking about Ishapanishad, what had touched my heart. And after the class, people came up to me and said, what a nice class that you gave, how interesting, how wonderful. And I was like dumbstruck. I was completely surprised because it is a fact, when you talk on behalf of Krishna, and if there's an audience who wants to hear about Krishna, Krishna takes over. You are just a transparent medium if you don't interfere with the personal agenda. If you have a, a dubious agenda, then it will not happen. But if you're just talking on behalf of Prabhupada and Krishna and want to say something according to the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he will take over. He will take over. And if you ask me, my work in developing the inbound school of yoga, 
my work in regards to the Oida therapy and the Oida Veda therapy. My involvement in the spiritual environmentalism and all the things connected to that, it is inspired. It is not my personal plan. It is something which happened to come to me as I was concerned for the future of you and your children, as I was concerned for the contribution of Vaishnavism in this world. How will people look upon Vaishnavas? What kind of contribution Vaishnavas will give? And you see, a doctor of the soul is the most dignified position in the whole world. It's a Brahmin. A Brahmin is a doctor of the soul. A Brahmin, he's a well-wisher of everybody. He doesn't worry about money. He lives from donations. That's what we are doing. In the Sierra Nevada, in Colombia, just over the last period of one year, we got three beautiful farms to donate. Somebody wants to live there, just come and talk to me. Maybe I make you a leader there. Three beautiful farms. Plus, there's two or three more farms which belong to devotees. One of them is an avocado and mango production farm. One devotee opened a, an Ayurveda clinic. Very nice. That just happens in one little place. So when, when you try to do things to please Krishna, things just come by itself. I mean, I can give you long lectures about difficulties and long lectures about facilities. What do you want to listen about? Difficulties is when you have something in this world and you want to get detached. That's difficult. Like sometimes people approach me, they have some success in this material world, and then they see how the devotees work so spaced out, so, so depending on Krishna, and they cannot imagine to be like that. So they're, they're, they're getting scared. That happens quite often. Those who don't have anything, they are more fortunate because they can innocently say, yes, I give everything I have, my life and soul, my heart. I'm not scared about gain, loss, because I have nothing to lose. Actually, nobody of us has anything to lose because nothing is ours anyway. And when we die, we won't take anything with us anyway. But the illusion is very strong. So we are trying to create a movement which is innocent, depending on Krishna. Sometimes devotees talk about economies systems, collapsing systems, or uh, when a system is like squeezing your neck, choking systems. I don't really entertain so much of these discussions. I just speak about the general negativity of Kali Yuga because people are not spiritually inclined. But as soon as you become spiritually inclined, your problem is solved. So those who are not spiritually inclined and they want to solve the problems in the non-spiritual inclinedness, they are poor people. 
always in anxiety. And they can't get anything real accomplished. They can't. Because they're always in a material anxiety. What will happen tomorrow? What will happen tomorrow? What will happen to my investments? What will happen? What will happen? So much I got today and tomorrow if I spend as much as I did today, tomorrow I have that much less. And if I do that every day, then within 85 years I'll have nothing. Oh. So now please, let me do nothing rather. Let me decrease my, decrease my spend expenditure so it will last me for 95 years. Something like this always in anxiety. And not in the spirit of producing. Not in the spirit of generating energy and beauty. And not in the spirit of generosity either. It's all calculation. <laughs> when, 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 how, 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 why, why, why? And then you read the newspaper. Oh my God. Everybody's getting less. And the riches get more. And the government makes more laws. I mean, of course, I am not gullible. I know we have to face certain circumstances. I know we have to be realistic about certain things. I'm not a total dreamer, but I fly in the mercy of my Guru. He has taken me under his wings of positivity. He has taken me all the way down to the most difficult places in the world. I've preached in the slums of Brazil. And I've had preaching centers there. Some of our preaching centers, when you see them, you say, what? That place they are preaching? Yes, not only that, we're making devotees there. I've been in, in the most diverse, like the one thing, <coughs> when I went to Bolivia first, I tell that story many times, it was so impressive. The devotee who I sent to Bolivia, he rented a teeny little apartment somewhere in the mountains of La Paz, where nobody would go. Like going up, 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 more downtown, let's see if we find something. So, we saw there were two flats renting close to downtown. So we got in a taxi, and the taxi went downtown, and all of a sudden, boop, 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 the taxi motor failed. I said, what is this? Taxi motor fails. And we had not reached our destiny of that, that place. So, so we got out of the taxi, no more taxi. So we were very close to the main square. So I said, OK, Krishna put us on the main square. And let's look what's happening on the main square. <laughs> so we are walking on the main square. All of a sudden, somebody tips me on my shoulder. <coughs> I turn around and I look at a, a man in his 60s and he asked me, do you have anything to do with A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada? I said, yes, he's my spiritual master. Oh, really, that's wonderful. I bought a book of his many years ago when I went to the U.S. And I love it so much. I was always looking for one of you people to see how I can help you for bringing something. I said, well, good. We are just looking for a place to rent. He 
said, for rent, for what? For giving classes, for, for having meetings with other devotees. He said, no, I, your problem is solved. So he took me just one street, not even half, half a street from the main square. He was the owner of a huge <coughs> hotel. And in that hotel he had like a La Versailles room, which was like a ballroom. He said, you can use this room, then he had another room. Then he said, downstairs I have internet uh, place, so you can use internet here. So he was called Don Mario. So we preached in that hotel for a year. Later his he had to go to another city where he also had some properties and his staff was doing a little politics about the presence of Hare Krishna so much in Ota. So we couldn't stay there permanently, but we can still go there until today, ten years later, and do programs. So out of the blue, out of nowhere, Krishna provided us the best, most prestigious place for preaching, free of cost. So this is the this is the, the flight I'm on. It's completely in Krishna's hands. And I'm not saying that to be lazy because I don't want to do anything. <coughs> it's because I know my limitations and I know Krishna's greatness. So I I don't really pay attention to world wars and and uh, economical crisis and and choking systems because they're just the karma of this world. Of course, when I want to rent a place in Bad Homburg, I have to make sure I I'm allowed to do what I'm doing that they don't come and close me next door next day. So in a way, I'm I have to be cautious and you know in Europe is many rules and regulations. In India is lots of corruption. Europe is lots of rules and regulations. And South America is lots of improvisation. So every place has a little bit of some special features. And somebody says, well, well, in Europe it's not like in South America. But actually you're wrong because Krishna is in charge of India, Europe and South America. He's, he, he just manifests his grace in different forms. So you can have your innocence back and be happy because we are right now working for the happy future of our children. And our children, that's including you, if you're now a little older, you may say, well, I have to take control of it myself. Well, maybe you have to. I hope you do it in the spirit of dependency on Krishna. Depending on Krishna, you'll find lots of service. I mean, so much service, so much. Unbelievable. Everywhere. And the eco-yoga farms, the eco-yoga villages, they are a feature which are very difficult to have. <laughs> this is a very precious, a high price you have to pay. Just like Halada Prabhu, he's living in an eco-yoga village in Mewegen for so many years. And when they have to heat through a 20 or 30 degree winter, he knows what the hardship is to keep your house warm, to keep your children fed and all that. But he has also not only been there, but he has been also in, in Berlin through his son. He has started the whole therapy center with Jayanti and of course Shama Mohim. He has 
attracted more devotees to move into the area. <coughs> the whole thing is like Govinda's Bahnhof in a way or another is just floating in a way. <coughs> it's very beautiful, very progressive, very sound. But with lots of tapasya. <coughs> Without tapasya, it doesn't work. So, I consider to live in an eco yoga village a huge privilege. Great privilege to be up to get up in the morning and see trees and sky and and natural environments. Oh my God! Every day. That is mercy, mercy, and mercy again. And it has its price, no doubt. Eco yoga villages. <laughs> so now, at this point, with all the projects we are starting, which are very pioneering, we have around 40 eco yoga villages, if I count right. Some of them are so pioneering, you cannot call them an eco-yoga village. It's just an eco-yoga spot. <laughs> but none of them. But then we have some others. Then we have... We have some eco-yoga villages which have joined the World Volunteer Network and they, some of them are so successful like Argentina, like Eco Truly and some other little less but also moving they have 25 to 30 volunteers simultaneously there. Practically, they have the biggest Bhakta programs in the world going on because the young volunteers, they all want to know what is this Bhakti Yoga and how to practice it. As a matter of fact, we have two types of volunteer programs. One is the ashram volunteer, where you can learn how to be a, a monk as well. And the other one is the ecological volunteer, where you are basically just participating in the, in the idealistic development of an ecological community. So, of the 40 uh, farms we have, I would say only six have implemented yet the volunteer program successfully. The others, they have to learn how to do that, because it's not so easy. But for example, in Pamplonita, that's a very nice place between Colombia and Venezuela. It's in Colombia. The mayor of Cucuta gave us a piece of land, of two hectares land with river and everything. And it then so happened that behind our land is a devotee who owns 400 hectares of land. And this is the first cow protection place 100% in the Vrinda family. That place right now has 34 cows. We grow, we grow there chacha fruto, one of the most amazing trees in the Andean mountains, which produces, it's the tree bean. It's a tree which produces huge type of beans. It's an unbelievable amount of food which this tree gives, and the cows love it. We could feed many more cows there. Anyhow, we have just started this, and there's an absolute vow that no cow will ever leave this farm. So, 
so they are living there, they're eating there. I visited them recently. I walked around with the cowards and, and with the devotee in charge of the program. It's right next to our temple farm. And the vow was made that this is going to be the first cow protection place, 100% of Rinda. And we hope we can produce the cheese there for the devotees in the restaurants, because when the devotees use cheese, whatever you buy in the market is not perfect. It's just not really high, high quality, and like that. So we are trying to go into that direction. <coughs> On the other side of our farm in Pamplonita, another devotee owns 29 hectares of land, and he wants to make a Vedic village there, selling to devotees small plots so that they can buy there and live a simple life. That's a bit experimental, but I cut a nice deal with him that whatever land he sells to the devotees, one part of the income will go to the development of the main temple. So in this way we'll have like a, a nice community effort. As it grows, there'll be finances for the temple. So this is just one thing which happened over the last 12 months. So in this way Krishna, he doesn't have any scarcities. He can do anything and everything he wants at any time. We just have to be very serious about it and do what we can. Do what we can and be happy. Our city centers, of course, are a little diff different. Because in a city center, of course, you have to live very socially. You can live in our city centers and it's quite austere, like if I think about my Mataji Ashram in Berlin, now they have like eight Matajis there, or something. So this is quite a, quite a, quite a great number of people for the small size of the rooms and everything. But I myself feel ecstatic about it. I feel that they are very blessed and fortunate to be in that situation. So, and of course we want to train up leaders for the future. For me, every man and woman shall become a leader if they are ready to, or help a leader, which comes out the same. If you help a leader, then you also a leader. So, but of course, that's our training, that's our spiritual community. In South America, we have a nice saying, it says, either you cut the wood, or you give somebody else the axe. <laughs> but don't be a nonsense who doesn't cut the wood and who don't want to borrow the axe. Don't be the, like that nonsense. So. That's all what it's about. We have to cut the wood, borrow the axes, and be realistic about our contribution, our participation. And also, I must say something, I've also lost my innocence sometimes. When I see how little desire to do service <coughs> is there in many people, <laughs> How little desire to do something real, to sacrifice something real. Okay, that's what it is, then I have to live with this. If the people in general are not so eager to do something, somebody gives a hundred euro donation in a year and he thinks, wow, I'm a very generous devotee. Well, 
thanks for the 100 euro for Krishna, it helps for sure, but I'm not going to maintain a temple with your contribution. <coughs> so it's, it's like that you have to, in, in Krishna Ganji, you have to be very realistic. But the most surprising thing that there's some people, they give everything. And those who give everything to Krishna, they make the difference. They create the temples, they maintain the temples. They make sure that Krishna consciousness is spreading. And if some people are not in a generous mood, so what? They haven't read the Bhagavad Gita really well yet. So let's hope we can convince them to read the Bhagavad Gita so that they will understand what they are missing. If you don't put Krishna in the top priority of your effort and your life, if you don't do that, <coughs> you miss out. You're the one who's missing. I like to share everything because first of all I don't own anything, nothing. How in the world could I think I own something? When everything has come to me by the flying grace of Krishna. Grace has just come our way, this way or other way. A few days ago one devotee, he donated a farm to me. He was living in the U.S. and he had some other, some money and some family members said, hey, I got a good offer on the farm. So he bought it and then he realized that he cannot go there. It's not for him. So he said, if you want, I give it to the devotees. We're talking probably about a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar donation. No? So then I went to this farm. It's called Goloka. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a designer village. It was the best landscaper in the world could not have designed anything better. It has six natural pools, a great swimming pool with crystal water. And one pool is connected to the other with waterfalls. It has rocks. Each rock is like an art exhibit of nature's unbelievable powers of moving rocks. It has 12 hectares of cultivatable land. It has another river. No, it's, it's a dream place. No, you could not landscape anything that beautiful. No way. I went with a devotee. He said, if I would have known what I have here, I would not have donated it. <laughs> because he never went there before. He just saw a few pictures and you had to do some hiking to come to the pools. So he had never seen his pools. I was absolutely so, so much beauty. And no neighbors. <laughs> you don't see any neighbors. Totally isolated. It used to be a cocaine laboratory. <laughs> because the people who were owners of that before, they had a cocaine laboratory there. And then the police found out and they went there and threw a bomb into the facility. 
now we are turning the cocaine la laboratory into a bhakti laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> because it's many big pillars we can make a big temple there in the same space and yes it's just I'm so amazed so amazed what Krishna can give us but now how to make good use of it that is the great question how to make good use of it? Because devotees, they use for Krishna what they have. There's only one problem in this. If you really want to use something for Krishna, at least to some proportion, you have to renounce the notion of private ownership. So when people come to me and they have a farm or something, I say, it's simple. Donate a portion of your farm and make it a community project. Then this will be, because if it's something privately owned, other people will not want to invest in there. You are, you are not deserving donations if it's for private use. There's a few technicalities to maintain the innocence. If something is private, it means you can say yes, and tomorrow you can say no. You can say today, come and help me, and tomorrow you can say, get out of here, I don't want to see you anymore. So, of course, I cannot work with such vulnerable places. Of course, even devotees very mature, like for example Los Vedas. Los Vedas doesn't belong to the devotees, it belongs to Mother Gambira. It's an Ayurvedic clinic, beautifully set in, in Onda, Onda uh, Santa Marta, and, and she's a very nice devotee, Mother Gambira. As a matter of fact, she's helping a lot the other farms. So we have accepted her clinic as part of our project because she's very genuine. But she's not getting donations on behalf of Krishna. She's making her money with whatever business they do there. On the contrary, <coughs> they're giving donations to other projects. <coughs> these are little things. Little things, one has to understand them very well in order to be successful. And we want to be successful. Our One other feature we have in our Vedavi, <laughs> it's also connected to innocence. In our Vinda mission, all artistic contributions, all creative contributions, they renounce the intellectual propriety. I mean, it's not an obligation. If somebody says, I want to retain the intellectual propriety on my ABC, it's your problem. You can do so. But basically what the devotees do in the field of art, music, it automatically belongs to all the other devotees of the family. <coughs> Just like all the eco-yoga villages, they belong to all of you. Can you imagine Brahma goes to, to Sofia and he meets a person who says, what are you doing? I'm, I'm helping my eco-yoga villages. Yes, what is that? Yeah, I have 50 eco-yoga villages in the world. What? 
Well, now what's going on? Do you have 50 eco yoga verses? Yes, in India, I have two. In South America, in Hungary, we go there. We... And that's true. Brahma has 50 eco yoga villages, plus so many temples, because that's what is the price. You want to get everything? You have to give at least something. You're not ready to give something, you cannot expect to get everything. But my disciples, basically they get everything. If you want to distribute any of the videos of Rinda, any of the music of Rinda, we have more than a hundred musics, studio recordings made by the devotees. If you want to use any of the graphics produced or the arts, if you want to use any of the books printed, if you want to reprint them and make some endeavors with them, you are welcome. You have to understand that. That's a unique feature. It's a very unique feature. I learned that from Srila Bhakti Rakak He said that about his books. He says, my books, they can be, my teaching, they can be distributed by anybody who wants to utilize his knowledge and give it to others. So we're talking about utilizing farms, projects, teaching, <coughs> including <coughs> certifications. If somebody wants to become a, an inbound yoga teacher, then we will give him the free training for that. <laughs> if somebody wants to become an OIDA therapy assistant, we will give him the training for that. Tomorrow, Lakshmi is going to give a, a seminar in Berlin about healing through <coughs> laughing and faith in transcendence. So it's something she's doing. She's been a professional in that for many years. She's recognized by the University of Tenerife. She's giving titles in Tenerife in all the islands of Tenerife, from the University of Tenerife, for her, uh, for her seminars. And yesterday she said, I want, to, I want to give a seminar to the devotees here. So, so we have that tomorrow from 1 to 5. You're welcome to assist this. So... <coughs> That is what is the unique thing of a real family. Why? Why am I not trying to make money with this? Because you cannot make f money in the family. I mean, you can give donations in the family, but you, you cannot make money, you cannot. It doesn't fit together with the real meaning of spiritual. Plus, somebody composes a song, well, did he compose it or did Krishna give it? When I give a class, I'm not the owner of that class. Thanks. If I paint a picture, I'm not the owner of that picture. Of course, all has to be reasonable. If I ask Prabhupada Kripa, to help me to make some electric installing in some temple somewhere. I can see his face already. He's going to say, Gurudev, anyhow, anytime, of course. Because he's always ready to give his knowledge for, for helping others. Many times I've seen that. Then, of course, if he's going to spend two months there doing that, then maybe we have to also pay him something for his time because he's not working in his place to maintain his family. It's like that, but everything what the devotees have, the talents the devotees have, we share them. Gita Majari is not coming here and 
Sri Ram is not coming here, oh, let me sing and get some money. Because it doesn't fit in the family. You don't do that. You don't sing for your family and friends and then charge for it. But again, it's a free thing. I'm just sharing to you my modus operandi. And that's what brahmachari or renunciation means. Our people make websites. <coughs> Nobody who has ever made a website for Rinda has charged. Nobody. So many devotees have done far out websites. Patita is doing the card records. Ananta Shanti has done so many websites over the years. Vishaka made website. Krishna Kirtan is making websites in Polish. So, so many devotees have done things like that, they don't even think about charging. And better so. So this is something which is a unique feature. <coughs> Therefore, I could, I could almost easily claim that when you become a real member of this family, you become one of the richest person in the world. <laughs> because all the things you have all over, all the welcome you get, Want to go to Mexico? Swami Marsh says, Haribo! Huh? Want to go to Guatemala? Prabhu Rupa says, Come on, come on, I was waiting for you. <laughs> Anywhere you go, the devotees get go, Haribo! Thank you for coming here, thank you for helping here, thank you for, uh, thank you for being a devotee, thank you for being my brother, my sister. Krishna consciousness, you can get anything. Even a devotee husband and a devotee wife, even that we can supply. Of course, you have to behave yourself for that, no? no? Everything is there by the grace of Krishna. Ist das damit gesagt, dass wir Zeit einstellen? Haben es doch erst nach einer halben Stunde Okay. Anyhow, that was my, my commentary on innocence and the Rinda family. I just want to say this as a one feature. For me, this is my personal uh, contribution in my spirit of transcendental socialism and everything belongs to Krishna and not to an always competing society. So then the question may be then how do we live? And the answer is very simple. You live by the mercy of Krishna. And if you need to make some money, then go and make some money, distribute some items which favor the people when they give donations.